Um, I have no slides. I'm sorry. You can just imagine them yourselves. Um, the first thing I have to tell you, by the way, is I was originally told I was speaking at 12.15, uh, which was going to give me an hour to write my speech between events. So we will be busking this. Um, I, first, I, I suppose for my generation, I'm 44, so I'm middle-aged now, which I know some people say, like, is that really middle-aged? It is. I, 88's the best I think I'm going to be able to manage. And my generation were one that was, I suppose, post-space race, given many wonderful ideas of what the future might be. And I know people now who are kind of, they, they feel slightly miserable. They feel they go, oh, the, the future's not what I thought it was going to be. And they'll say things like, where are the flying cars and, and the food in pill form, right? Which, neither of which I think are particularly good things either. Who, who, care, who wants food in pill form? People are happy with it in buckets. They like it in buckets. They don't need it in pill form. We don't want air rage. All of these things mean that people just look at the kind of the, the most enormous images from Eagle Comic. That's the image of the future that they kind of imagine. And my thought is really that we're not noticing the fact that the incredible delivery of the future. When I think about when I was a child, like, for instance, this book, I was reading this book uh, yesterday. Uh, it's about the KLF and uh, the burning of the million pounds. And uh, in the book, there is a mention of, uh, of Top of the Pops when Doctor in the TARDIS was on. And I thought, I wonder what that was like. And so I just went to YouTube and I put in Doctor in TARDIS, Top of the Pops, and three things came up. And that seems like a very minor thing. We're already so used to that. The fact that all of the incredible archive, a huge archive, a vast library, an archive of millions of people's nostalgia and inspirations and passions is instantaneously available to us. You know, if you want to look at uh, eye dents of commercial television between 1964 and 1972, you can see every eye dent that was on commercial TV, every different form of Anglia and ATV and all these long, just their eye dents. Someone's put them together. If you want to see a speech of Jane Goodall talking about the behavior of chimpanzees, if you want to know about how the Large Hadron Collider works through various different forms of animation, if you just want to watch a 1980s discussion show in which Mary Whitehouse looks very cross about some nudity, all of those things are there. This incredible library that, if you've seen Rollerball, you may remember that Ralph Richardson there is head of the library. And this, it's a very, just this one place, he is in charge of the library and very few people go there. That library is available to us all of the time. And this is my fear. My fear is that we have become very blasé, that we haven't realized about the shoulders of giants that we are all standing on, and that what we have available to us now, if imagined, at the beginning of the 20th century would be remarkable. We have become blasé. So we're just used to the fact that there are 200 different television channels. We are used to the fact that YouTube has all of those. We are used to the fact that if you go into a hospital, the fact that you can have a general anaesthetic, the fact you can have a local anaesthetic, all of those things. And we got to this point where we go very quickly. Human beings feel either stressed or bored. Very, very quick. It doesn't matter how much. In fact, we're offered so much now that people are almost instantaneously bored. There's too much. It's all rubbish. That's it. And then we feel stressed. And of course, th there's no reason not to feel stressed. Being a self-conscious being is not easy. But equally, it is better than it was in the 17th century. If you go back to the 17th century, and if we just every now and again, this is the thing, rather than look at the future, I want to slightly look at the past and say that by looking at the past, we can realize what we have and realize the potential of what we have. You know, the 17th century, an average day was, what are you doing today? Burying more of my family. <laughs> Didn't go well with that plague, did it? No, it went around like wildfire, as did the wildfire. So, what are you going to do for the rest of the week? Claw potatoes out of the near-frozen soil with my leprous hands, buy a piece of meat that's a bit green, have diarrhea for two weeks. You could be stressed then. Whereas now we will get stressed at the most minor thing. You can go, you know, you, you're stressed, what's the matter? My friends arrive in five minutes and the cake that I've made is vaguely disappointing. Ah! What would Mary Berry say? And this is, a, this is what worries me. That we are so, just, like, even our joys, this is the other problem. The things that we have that are joyful, we turn into work. Things like shopping, if you've been down somewhere like the Westfield Centre in Shepherd's Bush, if you go down there, do you see people gleefully going, look at this, 
a palace of delights. All the shiny shit I ever wanted, right? Do you see that? No, you don't. You see people going, oh, this, John Lewis is closed in five minutes, and I need a new dressing gown. People have got to this stage where they're, they're kind of going, this is, what are you doing today? Oh, it's terrible. I have to go and buy things that I want with money that I have. <laughs> and I've got to carry it home myself. The agony. This is like, you see things, like, again, the future, this is, the future is delivered to us so speedily, so quickly. We just, we, we expect it. It's just expected that every single week there will be a new piece of technology. That's what you want to go, the future has become banal. We don't look at something, you know, you go back again 100 years and you imagine that time where a group of people were watching a screen and a train suddenly came towards them and they went, ah! And they felt an incredible sensation. This was entertainment. This was nothing like they'd ever seen before. Now we just want that. I expect the Apple shop went there the other day. It's been a month. There still isn't a thing that's smaller or louder. I'm furious. <laughs> right? That whole thing of going, we, we, we're in a constant journey to kind of find that, like, the final jigsaw piece of our happiness. That's the thing, is each time you go, if I buy that thing, I'll be happy. And you go and you go, what's that? And you go, it's a small thing you can hold in your hand. Good, I need one of those. Excellent. What's it do? Well, it plays films on that really tiny, so you can watch them just there. Well, that's really good, because if a film has cost $400 million, it probably is best watched on something the size of a thumb. That's great. Yeah, this is, this is really good. Does it do anything else? No, it kind of helps balance you if you're holding a phone in the other hand. Well, I do need that. And then you go home, and you're very, very excited. You go, look what I've got. I've got the A523. Isn't it amazing? And your friend goes, what? They bought the A524 about three hours ago. What? It's much better than yours. It hasn't even got a screen. You just have to imagine the film that's playing. It's far more interesting. And this is the, you know, built-in obsolescence can be so quick that you, you think, I bought something and hopefully I'll get home before it's obsolete. <laughs> You're not noticing the fact that these things, that, the, that this phone that I have in my pocket here, that's, that to me is an incredible thing. And it has so many uses, and yet, by the way, I should probably return to my speech at some point. Um, but this is what I'm all about, is just going, these things are remarkable. These things, that the, the ability, the fact that when you're on your phone and you go through a deep tunnel in the middle of a mountain and you go, oh, I've lost my signal. Ah, oh, my phone's rubbish. That's, no, you're in the middle of a mountain. For the rest of the time, you can speak to anyone across the world. You can even Skype them if you can do all those things. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, I was in a lead-lined box the other day, unaware whether I was alive or dead. And, but, and so I think that when, when we see you know, these things, when, when, we, when we get blasé, when we don't notice the things about healthcare, when we, when we look at the fact that everything has to be fun as well, everything has to be fun. We are so bombarded by fun. Fun, that's it, you know, fun caps lock. I, don't, I can have fun lowercase. I don't need to have fun caps lock all the time. And so everything, one, everything becomes difficult, everything becomes kind of stressful, and, and two, we stop noticing things. This is the most important thing, the reason that we live in the world now, and I know the 21st century has a lot of challenges. You know, one of the great problems and one of the great wonders is the internet. The internet gives you access to so many different worlds. It gives you access to some of the, the greatest pieces of literature ever written by speeches and university. You know, when someone writes something ridiculous about climate change, you can just go, here we go, here's a link to 12 different papers that will show you that you're talking absolute nonsense. We have all that, but also the internet is a constant distraction and it has one other problem, which is because it's meeting the whole world, because I mean, some, some people feel very gloomy about the internet. I mean, I, I can see that with things like, you know, with Twitter, we get people going, oh, there's a lot of hate there and it used to be better in the old days. And I think about, you know, the Tyburn hangings and the witch trials and children in chimneys. Um, eight-year-old prostitute selling watercress and never seeing a park in London. And I think, well, it doesn't really sound that utopian. And this is the thing where we have to try, when it comes to things like this, is to use it properly, to use it effectively, to learn something that was being talked about in the event I was doing before, which is we need to actually have some etiquette, some ethics when we're on the internet. That when you go on something, because people used to call the internet, internet and used to call computers pornography machines. And they're not pornography machines anymore, they're rage machines. They are machines that you go, do you know what? I haven't felt furious at all today, but I know someone who normally tweets 
ill-founded articles from the Mail on Sunday. I'll go and have a look at that, and then I'll get really angry, and I'll spend the rest of the day being absolutely furious. That seems like a good thing to do. Equally, we have the other problem where, because the internet is meeting the whole world, it doesn't matter how ludicrous your idea is. It doesn't matter how frankly moronic your conceit is. You will be able to find 50 other people in the world who agree with you. And you'll be able to say, there we go, and thus I'm right. And I see that in science a lot with some of the arguments I have, because I, I do science programming, and I get people who write to me, and again, about things that it might be about climate change, it might be about evolution. Uh, someone wrote to me a while back where they said, if science is so good, why do they keep having to change it? And so I, I wrote back to them, and I said, this is the thing, this is another problem. We, we have to. We have to start realizing that the answer is not in, in being cocksure, and the answer is not in dogmatism. So I was explaining to this man, I said, he's a journalist, so I won't name, because he should feel deeply ashamed of what he wrote. And uh, I said, the idea of science, the idea of pretty much everything about us, is we can't find the right answer. What we're hoping to find is the least wrong answer. And the journey continues all the way along. You know, there's not going to be a time in, in our imagined futures in which someone will be able to say, it looks like we've finished science. That happened with physics at the end of the 19th century. Looks like we've nearly finished physics. Turned out they hadn't. We're not just in a Newtonian universe. There was a little bit, of, let's have a look at the particles when they're a little bit smaller. It's chaos, right? And suddenly, look away. No, keep looking. If you look away, they do more weird stuff. So <laughs> these ideas, and we are, so that, that's a difficult thing for human beings to take on. When we look at ideas of the future, the difficult thing is going, the next answer is possibly not right as well, but hopefully it is less wrong than the others. So I wrote back to this guy, I said, that's it, you see, the idea is, it's a path. You keep moving forward with luck, you find a less wrong answer, occasionally you go off on diversions, you go to other paths that you don't actually mean to go, and you go, ah, that turned out to be totally wrong, and then with luck you go back to the path where you increasingly find less and less wrong ideas. And he said, yeah, but science hasn't even worked out how the universe began. Now, I feel that is one of the bigger questions. <laughs> I feel, why does everything exist that's quite a big one, isn't it? So I wrote back to him, I said, well, yeah, to be fair, but I mean, that scientists have got to roughly the first 10 to the minus 34 of a second, but there is work to be done, definitely. And he said, yeah, but that's why my idea about how the universe began is as good. And then I had to explain to him that wrong is not a level playing field either. <laughs> wrong has different levels, right? Some things are wrong, some things are wrong, and some things are wrong! There are different wrongs. A very simple example would be if you got stung by a wasp and one of your friends goes, you've been stung by a wasp, do you know what you need to do? You need to put a bit of yogurt on the sting and that'll get rid of the stingy feeling. But your other friend goes, no, you must cut your hand off immediately before the wasp demon goes into your mind. Both of those answers are wrong. But I feel that one is more wrong than the other. This is why, again, this thing, I, I was doing uh, an event at QED Con a while back, back in Manchester. And uh, because everyone can be right, I was doing it with, uh, this, this was journalist Brendan O'Neill, and uh, the debate was, or discussion was, uh, is, is science the new religion? And uh, I said yes, as long as you count religion as being a kind of uh, series of self-correcting uh, ideas uh, that are advanced through experimentation. And uh, <laughs> apparently that's, that's not in the definition. But the argument that we mainly had was, I, I said, because his argument was, we don't need experts. Experts get in the way. Experts in politics. Science and politics shouldn't mix. Now, of course, in the world we live in now, that is a preposterous idea, because too much of what we do is powered by science. It would be wrong of any of us to ignore science. We can't have all of those things around us and just feel someone else deals with that. We have to think about what our actions involve and what they mean, and what are the ramifications of those actions, right? And he said, no, but we don't need. I said, look, the world has got more complex, whether you like it or not. You know, the things around us, all of these objects here, whether you look at those flat screen televisions, whether you look at the sound desk there, whether you look at the light and the projection, all those things, all of those things are more complex than 100 years ago. And he said, well, I don't think it is true. I don't think things have got more complex. At which point I picked up his iPad and went, could you mend this? And he looked scared. And <laughs> this is another reason why we have to tool ourselves up with as much knowledge as we can. When we have, this is the danger, the internet gives us all of that knowledge, all of those possibilities, 
And yet, quite often, we are distracted. When I was meant to be writing my speech, I was, in fact, on a new level of Angry Birds Star Wars. I was playing it for my son. He wants to play that level. He's only five. It wasn't my fault. But, man, I've got a lot less time than I imagined. Hang on. Right, so... Uh, the, uh, so anyway, this thing of we need to be experts. We need to, we, we, we can't have, uh, we need to be experts in asking questions. That's what we need to learn. We need to know the best questions to ask. We need to tool ourselves with the information. We need to realize that the way that we treat people on the internet as well is actually a direct communication with a human being, right? There is a lot of nastiness out there. That can, but this is another of the problems. You know, when people say, oh, the internet is such a negative thing. You know, I went on it and there were some horrible people. Do you know what? When you meet the whole world, some of them will be dead. There's no way around that. Here's the whole world. Or I met three of them. They were very rude to me. Therefore, I hate the world, right? So again, we have to think about those things. So the, uh, something about plowing and skylarks and the gutted rabbit. It's very well written, this, by the way. I'll turn it into a blog post because I forgot to say any of it. Um, the... <laughs> The, uh, that's, oh, no, I don't need to tell you that. Sorry, I'm just, I literally now, I've, I've realised that I'm, I'm just going to throw Huxley, Orwell, which one is the truth? Uh, oh, we live in a modern tragedy, manipulation, there we go. So this gets us up to this point. Because um, that's another thing I find, it, I, I do find the Huxley-Orwell debate. Are we in a Huxley world? Are we in an Orwell world? Well, we're actually not in either of those worlds, but both of them can actually inform us. In some nations, you will actually see they live in a more Orwellian 1984 future. In other nations, we live in a more Huxley world, where we are distracted by too many of the charming and exciting things. And again, being alert is very important, which is why I actually wanted to go way, way, way back in time and talk about something else, which is, I'm uh, very briefly going to mention Charles Darwin, because he, to me, is a lesson of how we move into the future. He is, of course, from the past, but came up with one of the greatest ideas with Alfred Russell Wallace that any human mind has ever come up with, the theory of evolution by natural selection. And he wrote 19 books in his lifetime, and when he was once asked what he felt he had that gave him the edge as a scientist, he said very humbly, I believe that I'm better than others in noticing things. That sounds like nothing, doesn't it? What are you good at? I'm good at noticing things. Oh, have you seen that? No, I haven't. I didn't notice that. You wouldn't have done. I've got a knack. Now, <laughs> this is what we need to do. We need to notice things. We need to be alert. There has never been... This is a... You know, I, I was, a, a while back, I was walking around a, a farm in Devon, and it was in February, and there was an incredible blossom tree. It was a freezing cold day, but there was a tree, and it was covered in blossom. And I looked at that blossom tree, and I immediately thought of the old interview which Melvin Bragg did with the wonderful TV playwright Dennis Potter, who was very, very ill. He would be dying very, very soon. And uh, at one point, Melvin Bragg asked him about kind of what he saw in life now, and he said, you know, sometimes I look out of my window and I see the blossom, and it's the blossomest blossom. It's the frothiest blossom. And, of course, that was delightful, and that stayed with me since the age of 24. And I thought when I was looking at that tree, look at the blossom now. Because one of the sad things about that with Dennis Potter was it was only when he knew he was about to die, suddenly the blossom looked so fantastic. And that's a dangerous thing that we do as human beings. It's sometimes it's only when we're about to lose something that we go, It's wonderful. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I met a guy who lost both his legs in an accident a while back, and he was, talk I was talking to him, and he said, you know what, I've only really become positive about life, excited about life after the accident. I thought we should make sure that we don't need something cataclysmic to happen to us to start looking at the world, to notice the blossom. You don't want to wait till I go, it was only after I lost my arms, my legs, and my head, and became a whistling torso that I noticed tulips were pretty. You don't want that. We've got to notice things. We've got to be aware of why we are alive now as well. If you think we don't have to go that far back in time to realize that a large percentage of this room would not have made it this far. Many of us would have died in childbirth. Many of us would have died in the first 10 years of life. If we made it to adulthood, then we might have a good go. But making it to adulthood was a real struggle. For women giving birth, it was a real struggle. There were dangers all around us. Now we have the possibility to live a full life and to not waste that life. You think again, going back to Charles Darwin and many others, if you ever start to think that your life, ah, yeah, it's all right, you know, I've got about 80 years, read books about Victorians, about 19th century individuals, and you will see how often they had to visit the graveyard to see other children and to see mothers and fathers put in the grave far earlier than they had to be. Annie Darwin died of these various different ideas, some say scarlet fever, some say tuberculosis related. Uh, Richard Feynman's wife died of tuberculosis. Um, many, many 
many people die. I was talking to someone from Middlesbrough who was born in 1940, and he talked about the number of his friends that he saw die of tuberculosis. We look at things like MMR. We look at that vaccination, and you think about that vaccination, and, you know, in Swansea, what was going on. We are ambivalent now. We are forgetting about living our lives because, well, of course, everyone gets 70 to 80 years, don't they? Well, people didn't. And we do, it's like I have a little BCG scar on my arm, and I'm sure you, many of you will have the BCG scar, the one that was against tuberculosis. Of course, clean water and all of those other things as well helped enormously. But I look at that little scar, it was a terrifying thing, but I'm sure you, we had to queue up, and then all the older boys and girls would just kind of walk past you and go, you're having the BCG? Ah! It's horrifying, the needle's that long, and they weave it into your arm, and then all stuff comes out. And now we all have little scars, not really because of the injection, but just because everyone went, if you had the BCG, boom, like that. Now, that little scar that I have, I see as being like a tribal scar, a tribal scar of human imagination, of human endeavor, of scientific possibilities, just a little reminder of the thoughts that it takes for human beings to advance, for human beings to realize the possibilities they have to not just be ambivalent or cynical, to look at all of the new tools that we had that were undreamt of in 1903, that we have available quite often just in our pocket. That, to me, is a wonderful thing. I will end just by saying, when we think about things like childbirth, childbirth, of course, some people here will have given birth, all of you will have been at least at one birth, um, though you may not remember it, and I've spoken to women and they say that, you know, it, it does smart a bit, and uh, <laughs> as far as, it's a pretty, you know, for most of the women I've spoken to, it's a pretty painful thing, and when you see the process of human birth, it is a lengthy process, it certainly can be a lengthy process, and a process that sometimes can be agonising. Right? Why is it so painful? Because of this. Because of this skull. This skull, it is a big skull. It's pretty much as big as a skull can be, and inside it, it has a brain and a mind. And if we don't use our brain and our mind, first of all, that is a very rude gesture to all the agony your mother went through. For her to have gone through that and you not to bother? Do you know what, Mum? I think I'm just going to be an idiot. No, you're bloody not. I screamed for 57 hours in Amersham General Hospital for you to have a brain. Now go and do a crossword, you little shit. Now, <laughs> so I didn't do the speech I intended because I didn't have time, but I, I do think, I genuinely believe these things. I think that we, we don't need to be cynical. We have the tools. We have the possibilities. And we have to be aware that, yeah, we can have fun. Have fun on the internet. Have fun playing games. But also think of all the other things that you can do. And you do this anyway. You know that. that the future is in the hands of interested people. And not only is it important to be interested, it makes the world so much more exciting than just looking at it cynically and going, that's the way things are. Politics is as it is. You can't do anything about it. That, to me, is a pointless waste of possibly 88 years of life. Thank you very much for your time.